on the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting, we are never alone. Hello, Edgewater. Pastor Dan here. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us here today. So glad that you are here. Uh, we are in week two of our message series called God with us. We, what we're doing is we are, we're looking at different ways that we can encounter the presence of God kind of in different seasons, different situations in our lives. Uh, if you missed last week, I encourage you to just uh, find that on our Edgewater Facebook page. Get a chance to watch that one as well. Um, so today we're going to start with the same verse that we started with last week, Matthew chapter 1 verse 23, where it says, look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So as our series is called God With Us. Um, last week we looked at how we experience God's presence in the valley. If you were with us, we talked about the, uh, the idea that we oftentimes enjoy God's presence when we're on the mountaintops, but we experience him intimately in the valley. So today what I want to do is I want to talk about kind of a little bit of a different metaphor from Scripture, and that is the wilderness. So how do we experience God's presence in the wilderness? How do we experience God's presence in the wilderness? Now, the wilderness is a little bit different from the valley because it sometimes feels like time in the wilderness lasts a lot longer. The wilderness is a barren place, a dry place, a desolate place where you feel very alone. Uh, one of the images often found uh, in Scripture when it's talking about the wilderness is kind of wandering through the wilderness. We're, we're, we're wondering, when in the world is this going to be over? We're wondering, when are we going to get out of the wilderness? Some of you right now, you may be in some type of wilderness. You're stuck in this job, and you're just kind of wondering, man, should I, should I stay here? Should I try to go do something else? Should I, should I go back to school? But then I'm going to have all the student loan debt. But it, again, at the end, I may have a better job. And so you just kind of are thinking around in circles. Oh, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in this place. Should I stay or should I do something different? You're renting a house and you're wondering, well, maybe I should, maybe I should buy a house because I'm not building up any equity. But if I do that, what happens if I get transferred with my job? I, I just don't know. And so you feel kind of stuck in this place. Oh, I'm dating some guy and, and he won't ask me to marry him. I, I've dated him and dated him and dated him and I've prayed and prayed and fasted and fasted and he still didn't do it. He's just sitting there playing video games. Should, should I stay with him? Or, or should I go out and find somebody else? So oftentimes in this kind of wandering and wandering in the wilderness, we often feel alone. We feel lost. We feel disoriented. We feel like nobody really understands what we're going through in the wilderness. Well, what's interesting is when you look at wilderness stories in the Bible, oftentimes the wilderness stories often follow mountaintop experiences. Wilderness times follow mountaintop times. And, and that's exactly what happened with Jesus. He kind of had a mountaintop moment with God when he was uh, baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. Heaven literally opens up and the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And the Father verbally and publicly expresses his love and approval for his son. God says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And, and it's a father saying he's proud of his son. It's a mountaintop experience. And then right in the next verse it says, immediately Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days. Mountaintop followed by wilderness. For some of you, maybe, maybe it's been like that. Maybe you've experienced that before. Things were, things were going along great, and then you found out someone wasn't being honest with you. Suddenly, in your, you're in the wilderness. 
You thought your spouse was being faithful and your spouse wasn't. And now you're in the wilderness. You're in a, maybe a financial wilderness. You're trying and trying and trying to get out of this debt and you feel so desperate. Whatever you do, it just doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to be enough. And maybe you've tried to tell people how you feel, but they just don't seem to understand. You feel alone. You feel spiritually dry. You feel desperate in the wilderness. So what I want to do today is I want to show you one big thought that we'll come to again and again. And, and I, I pray that, that, that it would be something that would really sink into where you are as you live through this. And the big thought is this, is that your deepest need, is, as much as it hurts, your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. In fact, I want to I show you a story from the Old Testament where this is lived out in a very real way. In uh, 1 Kings 19, uh, when we see Elijah the prophet, God had just used him in some massive ways. He was literally on the mountaintop, Mount Carmel, and he experiences the power of God. And almost immediately after this, we see him go from the mountaintop to the wilderness, where he's desperate, where he's depressed where he feels alone, where he feels scared for his life. To give you a little context, there's an evil king named Ahab. And King Ahab had an even more evil wife named Jezebel. And Jezebel heard about all that Elijah had done. And she got so mad that she eventually said to her husband, hey, you know what, sometimes the right man for the job is a woman. And and that's kind of what she did. She sent word to Elijah, hey, this time tomorrow, man, you are going to be dead. She threatened him. King, King Ahab had been coming after Elijah for years. But when Jezebel got mad, Elijah got scared. She makes the threat. Again, the king had been pursuing him for years. She makes the threat. And then this is what the Bible says. It says Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to uh, Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Now let me pause for a moment. Because when you just read it, without knowing what's going on here, you may not understand how far this dude ran. Okay, to run to Beersheba, now again, this is before Uber, this dude was doing it on foot. He runs about a hundred miles to get away from this crazy woman. This angry woman wanting to have him dead. So we're talking the prophet turns into Forrest Gump and just starts running. He got out of Dodge, he's scared, he runs a hundred miles. Elijah was afraid and he runs for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey. He was just on the mountaintop, but where did he end up? He ran to the wilderness. He was off in the wilderness where he's alone, he's scared, he's hurting, he's desperate. And he came to a broom bush and he sat under it and he prayed that he would die. And he said, the words that so many of us have said or maybe at least felt at some point in our lives, he said, you know, I've had enough, Lord. I just can't take it anymore. He, he had put up a fight. He had fought with bravery. He had faith. He had courage. And finally, he's just at the end of his rope. I, I've had enough, Lord. Maybe, maybe some of you have just said those very words. You, maybe just in the past little bit, you've said, I'm done. I'm spent, I've had enough, I can't take it anymore. You're raising kids, you're raising teenagers, at some point you'll say it, I've had it up to here, I've had enough Lord, I just can't take it anymore. Some of you are maybe in a, in a work situation where finally the, the straw breaks the camel's back and you're, I can't take it anymore, I can't take another day in this place. Financially you're trying to get ahead and you're making progress and then car breaks down, your, your toilet overflows, your two-year-old puts a tic-tac up their nose, you got to go to the emergency room to get it removed. And, and you're like, what is this, God? I just can't take anymore. You feel overwhelmed. Sometimes it's even just the accumulation of the smallest things. 
You know, you, you work hard, you serve faithfully, you make everybody the, the greatest meal ever at your house, you put it out on the table, it's made with love, they eat it in 30 seconds, they leave all the dishes on the table, so you turn into Jezebel and you're like, I'm going to kill somebody, by this time tomorrow, everyone who ate of my food will be dead if this is not cleaned up. It just kind of pushes you over the edge. Apparently, this is kind of what happened to Elijah the prophet. Because let me tell you what, this guy had experienced the incredible, amazing power of God. He had been in, in God's presence. This guy had fought with bravery and boldness. In fact, if you don't know the, the backstory, he faced down this, this evil king and he prophesied and he called for a drought as a punishment for the king's sins. And sure enough, God stopped the rain. And, and so the king is mad at Elijah, so he sends all of his forces after Elijah. Elijah hides for three years. God's protecting him. Um, God miraculously feeds him uh, with, uh, through, through ravens from heaven. Then, then God uses Elijah to raise the life of a dead boy. The, the prophet stares down 850 prophets of the false god Baal. And he calls down fire from heaven. And God shoots fire down from heaven and burns up the altar. And he kills all the false prophets. Elijah eventually calls for, for God to, to make it rain, and he sees in the distance the cloud the size of a man's hand, as Scripture says. And he has the, the faith to believe that God is bringing the provision of rain, and God does. The prophet experienced the protection of God. The prophet experienced the provision of God. He knew very well the presence of God. He had experienced some of God's greatness, and then when Jezebel makes a threat, he runs for his life. Again, you may be feeling this way right now. I've had enough. I can't take anymore. I'm just exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. I'm doing the best I can, and the best I can just isn't enough. Dr. Henry Cloud is a, a great author and Christian psychologist. And one time he was talking about how oftentimes these days, when you ask somebody how they're doing, a lot of times the response is, hey, I'm I'm tired. And, and Dr. Cloud said that they're probably misdiagnosing their challenge. He said, most of you are not tired, because if you were tired, you could take a nap, and that would solve your problem. You're not in need of physical rest as much as you are in need of spiritual replenishment. He said, you're not just tired, you're spiritually depleted. You're not just tired, you're not just overwhelmed. What you need is an encounter with the very real, very holy presence of God. What you need is an intimate moment where you experience the grace, the goodness, the loving kindness, the mercy of the presence of God. You're not just tired. Maybe you do need some rest. Maybe some physical rest would be good. But even more than just physical rest, you need to encounter the presence of God. You need spiritual replenishment. This is what David said in the 23rd Psalm. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. Not just, not just tired, not just worn out, but I need the, the restoration grace of God for my soul. Not just physically exhausted, but spiritually depleted. So what does God do with Elijah? What I love about this is what God did not do. God doesn't preach him a sermon going, well, this is your fault, this is your fault, you don't have enough faith. God doesn't give him 10 verses to memorize or say, where, where, where is your faith, where is your belief in me? I've been there for you all this time and you're just turning away. What God does is he tells him to eat and rest. That's what God says here in Scripture in uh, chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. It says, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. One of my favorite concepts from the Bible, that sometimes the best thing you can do for God is to eat a snack and take a nap. But, but really, it's true. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to rest in the presence of God. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is just take a breather and just let God restore your soul. I, I love this. 
Next verse, the angel of the Lord came back a second time. I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't get it the first time. God comes back a second time and a third time because the presence of God continues to pursue you. And maybe some of you, God is coming back for you again. And if you don't get it today, he'll come back again. God comes back another time. And he touched him and he said, get up and eat because this journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he was strengthened by the food and he traveled 40 more days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the the mountain of God. Now, when he got there, he went into a cave and he spent the night there. And, And the word of the Lord came to him and said, well, what are you doing here? Why are you running away from me? What are you doing here? Maybe some of you, God, God talks to you that way. What do you think you're doing? You know better than this. What are you doing right now? You, you have access to me. Why are you running away from people? Why, why are you running away from me? What are, what are you doing here? And then Elijah starts getting a little, a little whiny voiced when he's talking to God. I don't know if... You ever put on a whiny voice when you're talking to God? I know that sometimes I get, get a little bit of a whiny voice when I feel like God isn't answering my prayers. God's not necessarily doing what I want him to do. I get a little whiny voice. And so Elijah replies, oh, I've been zealous for the Lord God Almighty. That's what I do. God, I've been working so hard. Why don't you hear my prayer, God? Why don't you do this for me? Whiny voice. And he says, well, the Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put the prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah is in the spiritual wilderness. He's, he's hurting, and his need is so great, he can't see anything beyond his need. Nobody understands. Nobody's doing it like I'm doing it. I'm all alone. I'm desperate. So what does God do? God meets him. In his deepest need. God ministers to him in his moment of vulnerability. God brings healing in the middle of hurt. That's why I hope you'll understand that your deepest need can become a gift when it drives you to depend on God. And God comes to him again and again and he reaches out to him in his deepest need. And in verse 11 God said, go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And Elijah's probably thinking, okay, this is what I need. I need God's presence because I'm scared for my life. I need God's presence. God is going to reveal himself to me. God's about to, about to pass by. And then a great and powerful wind came and, and tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks. And he's thinking, man, God is going to be in the wind. But Scripture says God wasn't in the wind. And after the wind was, in, was an earthquake, and, and surely God is in them, this massive shaking of the ground. Surely he's in the earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, and he's like, well, surely God's in the fire. He's got to be. But God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The ground shook. God wasn't in the shaking of the ground. The wind raged, but God wasn't in the wind. The fire burned. God was not in the fire. God God wasn't there in the remarkable. God was in the ordinary whisper. God was in the whisper. Why does it seem like when life gets tough that God's voice is so quiet? Why, why is he gentle? Why is that voice so still and so small? If God wants us to hear him, why does he whisper? Why, why doesn't he shout so we can be sure to hear him? Why doesn't, he, why doesn't he speak loud and powerfully in spectacular ways? If he wants us to know him and if he wants us to hear him, why does he whisper? I'll tell you why. God whispers because he's close. Because he's right there with you. He whispers because he's near. The devil shouts his lies, but God whispers his truth. God doesn't shout to get your attention. He whispers to draw you close. What what does he say to you? He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I've been with you every single moment. I love you more than you can imagine. 
When you hurt, I hurt. I'm with you in the valley. I'm with you in the wilderness. I'm with you in the storm. Why does God whisper? He whispers because he's right there. Because he's close. Where do you want to be when you're afraid? We have three dogs at home, and the smallest one is this little uh, miniature rat terrier named Marty. Uh, there are times he's just kind of a big ball of nerves, and we can always tell when it's getting ready to rain. Uh, we, before we see the clouds, before we hear the thunder, he knows, and, and he hates the rain. And so we know it's getting ready to rain because he jumps up onto the couch right next to Shaney and tries to become one with her skin. He, he burrows in, he tries to hide. And, and the other two will come and sit around at her feet. They, they want to be close to the one who makes them feel safe. Hear this, in the middle of the storm, you don't have to run off to God's couch. He's already with you. He's right there. He's close. If your heart's hurting right now, if you feel broken hearted, where is God? Let me tell you where he is. Scripture tells us in Psalm 34, verse 18, it says, The Lord is close to the broken hearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Why does he whisper? Because he's close. Because he's near. Because he's with you. King David, again, looking at part of the 23rd Psalm, says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. And like we talked about last week, even though I walk through the valley, again, the valley's not my destination. I'm just passing through. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he is with me. Because he is with me. Because he never leaves, because he's always close. He goes on and says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He anoints my head with oil. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely his goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Why does God whisper to his sheep? Because he's close. He knows his sheep by name, and his sheep know his soft and gentle voice. David said of God's presence, he said, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even if your hand guides me, your right hand will hold me fast. Your right hand will will hold me. God is so close that he can hold your hand. Why does God whisper? Because he's close. And one day, as you walk through that wilderness time, you'll discover that your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Here's what I hope you'll understand. We enjoy him on the mountaintops. But we get to know him intimately in the valleys. When we're wandering in the wilderness and we feel like nobody understands, God understands and God cares. And he is always good. He wasn't in the, the booming earthquake. He wasn't in the rushing wind. He wasn't in the raging fire. Where was he? He was in the whisper. He was in the whisper. And if you'll stop for a moment from the busyness and the hustle and bustle of this world... And you'll dig a ditch like we said last week. You make a well. You be ready for the presence of God. And he'll meet you there. Because who is he? The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. Which means God is with us. Why does our God whisper? He whispers because he's close. Please pray with me. God, thank you so much for this time today. God, I thank you that when we go through these times of wilderness where we may feel alone and wandering and wondering and confused, we know you are there with us. God, help us in those times to not get just so caught up in all of the things going on and, and running over and over again the list of things that are going wrong, but that we can stop and we can listen for your voice. Because you are there. 
You're waiting for us to be still and be quiet to hear what it is that you have to say about the situation, what it is that you have to say about us in the midst of this situation. God, help us to hear your voice. Help us to trust you. Thank you so much for being so close. Maybe you've been listening today and you're like, you know, I don't, I don't feel like God is close because maybe you've never taken that, that step towards him. Last week we talked about if, how there sometimes God says, if you show me your faith, I'll show you my faithfulness. So maybe today is the day you want to take that step towards God just to say, you know, God, I'm going to turn from my sin. I'm going to turn from trying to do it on my own. And I'm going to turn to you. Maybe today's that day. Well, the way we kind of mark the beginning of that time of beginning to follow God is uh, we, we just mark it off with a simple prayer. It's not a set of magic words, but hopefully it, it expresses some of the desires of our hearts. So I invite you to uh, repeat after me, phrase by phrase, and pray, Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Help me live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.